You know what? Hold It'll back be, on no. that. It'll be more because because after people get distracted with that stuff. This will finish this one. And then uh, this will finish this tape. Thirty-seven minutes. Okay. So um, we'll be passing these out at the yeah lunchtime. That'll work. That will work good. So um, going to share something with you from the issue of uh, failure to identify and uh, um, yeah. this is just a, a, a lesson on, on something on, on a, that comes up. I'm using this thing about failure to identify, but um, uh, it's got it's got other lessons in it. You'll see when I, when when we get through it. Um, so failure to identify something is all over the country, and so the cop stops you, for instance. He says, "Let me see your driver's license," and you say, "What's the problem, officer?" And uh, uh, he says, I, I, I asked you to show me your driver's license. Well, well, officer, I wasn't speeding. I didn't make a wrong turn. Enough. I asked you twice for your driver's license. Get out of the car. I'm charging you with failure to identify. It can happen that quick. Okay? Failure to identify is akin to contempt of cop. Okay? <laughs> it's, it's like something that they can charge you with almost no matter what. You know, I mean, they can just maneuver you into it. You know, and then say, well, you failed to identify, and that's that, you know, and they're hauling you off to jail. Um, anyway, uh, I don't identify, so they frequently haul me off. <laughs> so um, they bring this case against me, and um, I was in Kristen Wade's court. <laughs> Okay. Who's in what? Kristen Wade's court. I mentioned her earlier. Her dad was one of the handle Roe versus Wade. And we got, you know, Don Terry, who's with uh, Rule of Law Radio and all that. Uh, you got him out in an hour in Kristen Wade's court. But anyway, there I am, charged with uh, failure to identify. So. Um, they put the officer on the stand and, you know, after he identifies himself, the prosecutor asks him to identify the defendant and he says, yeah, this is the guy sitting there with the big beard. And, okay. And so then the prosecutor runs a line of questioning something along these lines that, uh, you know, I can't remember it verbatim, but uh, to the effect like, uh, well, and the date and time that you approached uh, Mr. Fox, did you ask him for his identification? Yes, I did. Did he identify himself? No, he did not. Did you explain to him that we have a law that requires it? Yes, I explained it to him. Did he identify himself then? No, he did not. Uh, did you explain to him that he could go to jail? Yes, I did. Did he identify himself then? No, he did not. <laughs> you know. And um, and so what happened next? Well, I got him out of the Suburban and put him in the back seat of the cruiser car. Well, did he identify himself then? No, he did not. He refused. What happened next? We took him to jail. Did he identify himself at the jail? No, he did not. He refused. Now, is it clear to everyone here that it broke their law? Pierce, so, right? So, they're, they're satisfied that they, they got it, okay? They got it. And, but I do get the chance to cross-examine this guy. So I said to him, well, isn't it a fact that in order to be a police officer, you had to swear an oath to support the Constitution? Well, yes, sir. And you did that? Yeah. Okay. And uh, on that date and time uh, that you approached me, uh, you were armed, weren't you? I said, what do you mean armed? I said, well, you had a nine millimeter on your hip, right? He said, no, it was a six hour 45. I said, very well, you were armed. And so I said, so um, 
Uh, having sworn an oath to support the Constitution, you attacked me by force of arms and attempted to compel me to be a witness against myself in direct breach of the Fifth Amendment. Isn't that so? <laughs> in perfidiously breaking your own oath and you're in felony breach of oath. Well, the cop is on the witness stand like, <laughs> the judge and the prosecutor both jumped out of their skins, case dismissed. <laughs> Just like that. And I can't tell you how many people pay, you know, because they'll, they'll fine you 100 to 300 bucks for that. You know? So it's that kind of thing. Like I say, you could win on the law, you could win on the facts, you could win on the procedure, you can win. On the council issue alone, you can win by prayer power, you can win by fluke. You know. Um, what were the words that you that you said? You know, I, I can't remember them verbatim, but it was just yeah, the yeah. gist of it. The gist of it was that I challenged him on the fact that he, he had sworn an oath to support the right. Constitution, and that by his actions, what he had done was attack me by force of arms an attempt to compel me to be a witness against myself. Well, how did he attack you? Forcing you to go to jail. Okay. Okay. If somebody comes up to you and says, buddy, can you spare a dime for a hobo? That's one thing. If somebody else comes up to you with a gun and says, I need your money. <laughs> the difference being, although the gun was not drawn, is implied. Yeah, well, they, they have various stages with that. Because they could come up to you and their hands can be visible, or they could come up to you with their hand on the gun. As they do. Okay? And in some cases, like we were coming back from Arkansas, and. Uh, uh, Steve LaRue is behind the steering wheel in the Suburban, and I'm in the seat behind him. And this jerk of a police officer pulled us over over the license plate light. Now, all the lights were working when we got on the road because Rick, the audiovisual guy that was with us, was checked all the lights before we left Arkansas. And so we're in Paris, Texas, and we get stopped for a license plate light issue. And because Steve just asked him a question, the guy pulled his gun out, he's a two-handed position, and about to shoot Steve in the head. And I'm sitting right in the direct line of this, you know. <laughs> Can you imagine the kind of stupidity? You know, and in point of fact, they jailed Steve, and I was, uh, I was challenging several of the city officials and the, at the court and everything else to, you know, because this cop's got no business pulling out his gun over a license plate light. And this is something that, that you have to understand. These things are not crimes. Uh, everyone knows that light bulbs are going to burn out at some time. And you could check it on the hour, every hour. And 15 minutes into it, the light bulb burns out. You know what I'm saying? Nonsense. You know? I mean, what they should do is just say, uh, your license plate light is burnt out. You need to get it fixed. Well, thank you, officer. I see you. You know, an auto zone there, I'm gonna get the light bulb right now, you know. Or I've got a spare thing. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I always carry spares. I try and carry all that stuff that's necessary in case. Who says you have to have a light? Yeah. Who says you have to have a light? That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question about that, about being stopped. I was stopped for my DOT plate and when they stopped me, I asked if I was under arrest, and they said no. I said, okay, thank you, you have a nice day. You're free to go, right? I said, oh, no, no. I said, okay. They said, you got to identify yourself. I said, okay. My name is Thomas Colletley, and I invoke the Fifth Amendment right, and I don't care to speak to you. 
The lady continued on and on. I invoked that fifth amendment right three, four times. They continued on and threatened to take my car and everything else. Now, when I go to court, can any of their testimony, anything they did, be used against me since I invoked that fifth amendment right? Um, well, they should have stopped trying right there. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm understanding the question right. right. Um, what I want to know is that once I invoked that and they continued to ask questions and continued <coughs> to demand identification, they would arrest me if I didn't identify myself. I told them I did identify myself. <coughs> My name is Thomas Colletti. You told me I'm not under arrest according to Arizona Revised Statute. I don't have to give any further identification than that unless I'm under arrest. And I invoke my Fifth Amendment right. But they can do yeah. it on and on and on. Yeah, I would say that you, you may be able to make some mileage out of that case that I've mentioned a couple times in recall because they cannot um, intimidate and threaten and coerce you to accomplish their ends which again is a violation of their oath of office okay when if you get the cop to admit that he kept on asking and pressing and it was the issues and he was armed as he did it then the the act is called perfidy okay and and so there's the word perfidy and perfidious and perfidiously um so he perfidiously breached his own oath of office and felony breach of oath uh, maybe as much as five years in prison and so this guy attacked you by force of arms breached his own oath what is his testimony worth at this point <laughs> right. I have, uh, stating his fifth amendment right is one thing but they, I don't see any reason they couldn't keep asking. But if he would have said, I won't speak without my attorney here, now it's got to stop. That is a good point. Um, that is a very good point. And, uh, uh, but he did tell him that he had nothing more to say to him. And he had invoked his right there. And what they should have said is you have a right to remain silent, you have a right to have an attorney present during any questioning and so on. You should have given them the, the Miranda warning right there and done so politely. But of course, those guys are like loose cannons. I mean, they're on a power trip, you know, and uh, it's a horror story. Well, most people don't know. The fact of the matter is there's statistics and thousands of people die at arrest. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, that guy that was whittling as he's walking down the street, yeah, right. you know, and the cop said something to him and he just continues whittling and walking and doing his thing. But he was deaf, right? Or something? Yeah, right. Yeah, so they shot and killed him. Or, or, some it was a, uh, a retarded uh, a child, Down syndrome. They tried to talk to him, and he was scared. And he ran. And he shot him in the back. I mean, you know, the poor kid didn't have the comprehension of the situation, except that it scared him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't comprehend them asking me for identification either. <laughs> He needed his Rambo fix. Sure. Uh, real quick, I had a flash to share an interesting thing with you all. Uh, some people work with this and some don't, of course. When, uh, credit card debt. And when they come with, they're going to sue you or whatever, uh, you can inform them that uh, uh, that they need to send the, all future correspondence to this P.O. box. So we're here in Arizona, so we'll, let's say the P.O. box is in Montana. Now, that doesn't mean that you move to Montana. 
That just means that they're to send all future correspondence to Montana. But they uh, can easily think that uh, that means you moved there. So now they need to package up the stuff and send it back to the bank on this credit card matter because the attorneys are here in Arizona and they're not going to litigate in Montana. So they send it all back to the bank. Now the bank has to find attorneys in Montana. And as soon as they do, you inform them that send the stuff to this P.O. box in Florida. <laughs> pretty quick, they run out of the statute of limitations and they haven't gotten anywhere with their lawsuit. Meanwhile, you haven't even left Arizona. You like it? Yeah, what's the statute? <laughs> I'm not sure, but you know, by the time by the time they start, there are the clock has already been ticking on them for a while. And they only have a certain amount of time left. Cool. And and even if even if there was no statute of limitations, how much of it do you think that they could stand? Hire an attorney's all time zero. <laughs> you know, have a big debt. Um, there was a, a thing uh, that one attorney that I know of, uh, like these chits that you sign for the for the uh, gas to uh, be put on the gas card, like it's you know maybe Shell or Exxon or something like that. So they sue. And his response was, well, I need to have a copy of all of those chits. You have to verify the signature of every one. Well, that means they have to send some secretary or file clerk to the file cabinets, and they have to open up all these file cabinets and find this one, find that one, line them all up on the photocopy machine, make copies of them, send them off. <coughs> so he lets it sit there for a while. And then he says, uh, writes him back and says, the photocopy's illegible. Huh. Now they have to send you back, pull all these things out again, <laughs> photocopy them all over again. They send him the copies, sits there for a while. Then he sends him a letter saying, they're illegible. Did that a couple of times, gone. You wouldn't chip me, would you? <laughs> so, how are we doing time wise? It's Fine. Lunch time. You want to do time? Yeah. yeah you know, how many minutes yeah. left on the tape? Well, we've got we got about a half hour on the tape. It looks like 35, but because I read it wrong last time. But it's 10 after. Uh, quarter after quarter after 12. So, anytime you want. To Come back at one. Unless you got something important to say. Um, want to finish another topic? Okay, well, we'll break for lunch. And, and so what I want to do when we get back is I want to basically go through the process and we'll talk about indictments. We'll okay. talk about the various steps of the process and some of the things that you can do for all one to wrench in your gears. Good. I'd like to share something with everybody uh, before, before Robert gets started again. I think this might be perceived as good news. Okay? There are people like us pushing back all over this country. And it's, all, it's starting to overwhelm their system, I believe. Is anybody aware of what's going on today, October 2nd, in the pulpits around the country? What pulpits? We're here. And, and, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, 501c3 prohibition against churches speaking anything, anything against public policy or, or political in the pulpit. Uh, it, it, it comes from uh, Lyndon Johnson when he was a senator and a couple businessmen disagreed with his position and uh, were, were backing the opposition using money from their 501c3s. They didn't happen to be religious 501c3s at that time. So he put this, so he put this little provision in the IRS code when he was a senator back in the 50s, I presume, um, that, that 501c3s can't, can't uh, speak anything political. Well, that's been that's been the the rule in 
most, most of the mainline preachers are abide by that. Never been tested in court, though. Group, a group in, in 08 decided to test this, so they got 40 preachers uh, to record their sermons and uh, say something political, and then they sent it all to the IRS, and they were going to back the fight and, and, and take the position and challenge it. Nothing was said. They just ignored it. So in 09, they got over 80 preachers to do the same thing. Nothing happened. Last year, they got over 100 to do the same thing. Today, October 2nd, there's over 400 preachers doing the same thing. So there is, there is momentum building, okay? That's wonderful. And, and this is, I, I think it's a good thing, okay? Yes. yes. So anyway, that's my story. <laughs> we're just commenting that things are getting worse. And I, and I, I think that's exactly okay. And I, and I think that's why we're seeing so much, much in, increased activity from them. Because there are so many people pushing back. Well, right? I mean, if it hits the moment, it's good. Yeah. Okay. When it starts getting the pulpits, it's very good. Yeah. 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 Can you zoom in on that? Yeah. 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 So, uh, this sign here, from this gentleman here, and they're normally 20, but he's, he, if for anyone in the group, it's 15. So if, I've never seen a, as nicely done as that. It's, congratulations, it's nicely done. And it's metal. Uh, yeah. I get behind our next break. What is that? What is that? The no trespassing sign. He, this gentleman here had custom made, and and he, he sells them for 20. But for the group, anyone in this group can get them from him today for 15. However, oh, there, there needs to be a warning on that. If you post that in your house or near your house, and the IRS sees it, they will classify you as a potentially dangerous person. Uh, I'm serious. We'll, 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 <laughs> Well, the potentially dangerous one of the three. Let me tell you. If you don't mind, they change your status. Dangerous As for me, as for me, I'm already known as a terrorist. <laughs> That brings up the point. I am so glad to meet all of you people. It's always wonderful to meet people of like mind, you know, and it's it's difficult to deal with the, the brain dead, you know, the people who don't think that you need to pay your fair share. Uh, that they think that, that uh, ragheads from some cave in Afghanistan knocked down the World Trade Center. You know, uh, that, that the Murrah building, uh, that, that McVeigh did that with, with a truck bomb, was a bunch of hooey. He deserves a Nobel Prize for the world's first suck bomb to actually, I mean, figure it out. Figure it out. <clears throat> this is the building, and this is the truck. How did this truck suck steel reinforced concrete out of the building and put it over here? <laughs> I just figured it out. You are. If this truck exploded, it would, it would blow in, not suck kind of steel reinforced concrete out. I mean, it's just like your truck. What was the hole at the bottom of the truck? In the street. Did you know that there were like security cameras and all that stuff around and that they seized of like 42 tapes it was one guy who showed up in pennsylvania that had one of the tapes they did a raid on him completely you know tore his place apart took the tape put him in prison in terry nichols trial they never showed any of the tapes of course the size 
the university seismographic thing showed that there were two explosions. Twenty-one seconds well, apart. Yeah, and and that uh, basically what happened is the building blew up before the truck. <laughs> and and uh, there was two bombs behind the building too that didn't blow up. Right, and and the initial the newscasts were that the, that the uh, fire department and paramedics couldn't go in because they were still removing bombs from the building. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what, t uh, t McVeigh had access to the inside of the building and installed bombs on the pillars? That was the day before. <laughs> yeah, that was the day before. Of course, coincidentally, the ATF had the day off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Robert, on the uh, Ferguson version of the Tyrants document, and uh, you said you're going to make additional comments about that. Off tape. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Off tape. We haven't started yet? Yeah. We have? I can, can pause, pause it. We're just a break. Okay, pause it. Right? Right? Well, Nine. We're back. Eight. Okay, we're on? We're on. All right. Um, so, 1030 at night. I get a call from a housewife down in Austin, Texas, and she tells me that her husband, Jeff Skiba, has been arrested by the FBI and U.S. Marshals, that he had come to Dallas to help a woman in her tax case, and uh, that he got himself arrested and he's in jail, and he's accused of threatening to murder a federal judge. Can I get him out of jail? <laughs> <laughs> That's a bit more than a parking ticket now, isn't it? <laughs> and, and so uh, uh, I said, well, I'll check into it. So I, uh, the first thing up, because this is like immediate, her call was, you know, when he was arrested. Not when he was arrested, but it was 1030 at night, but it was like the day he was arrested. And <clears throat> so, First thing coming up is probable cause hearing. So I go there and they bring Jeff Skiba in in the orange jumpsuit, handcuffs, you know, leg iron, his manacled together and a waist belt and all that stuff. And this poor fellow is like in shell shock. I mean, he doesn't know which way is up. I mean, I could tell right away it was non-functional. And so I stood up in the front row of the audience area and I said, excuse me, Mr. Skiba has, pardon me, I said, excuse me, amicus curiae, Mr. Skiba has witnesses to call. And the U.S. Marshals ran towards me like they were gonna tackle me off the field. Now they came right up on me, but they didn't dare touch me because I wouldn't be an assault. I had their hot breath on my face as I stayed focused with what I'm doing with the judge. <clears throat> and they called witnesses and uh, in the federal system, just about anything constitutes probable cause. You know, I mean, I could hardly believe what they were talking. Uh, anyway, the judge says, well, we find that there's probable cause to hold him over. I'm gonna set the bond. I think he said he was gonna set the bond on the Monday. So, uh, come back on Monday. I'm in the front row of the audience and they bring Skiba in and again, he's like in shell shock. You just tell he was non-functional. So again, I stood up in the front row of the audience area and said, excuse me, amicus curiae, Mr. Skiba has witnesses to call. Again, the U.S. Marshals were right on top of me. Got their hot breath on my face and I'm staying focused with the judge. And uh, I'm calling his witnesses and running his case from the front row of the audience area. And, and uh, sometime if you want to hear it, you know, my friend Brady was there and Brady could hardly believe what he was watching himself. Is, I mean, there are people here that have been in court a bunch of times. Have you ever seen anything like that? Somebody running the case from the front row of the audience area? No. Not an attorney? No. <laughs> so, so I call in Skiba's witnesses and, and uh, Skiba brightened up and he, he caught the flow of things and uh, so then he calls me as a witness. So I go and I'm, you know, I cross the bar and I'm headed towards the witness stand and the judge says, one more, Mr. Fox. 
you need to raise your right hand and repeat after me. And I said, I have a religious objection to the oath and uh, pursuant to Matthew 5, 33, 37, James 5, 12, says make no swearing at all. Anyway, I said, I've got a religious objection. And he said, well, you can affirm, can't you? I said, well, affirm is a euphemism for oath. I'm not going to do the oath. I don't affirm. Uh, and then he said, well, I'm not going to let you testify then. Huh. Oh, okay. So I turn around and I'm headed back to the audience area. And the assistant U.S. attorney jumps up. And I mean, this guy is gasping and sputtering. <laughs> Your Honor, we had some pre 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 previous experience with this, Mr. Fox. <laughs> the Circuit Court of Appeals, they said it would be okay, so, so long as he says under penalty of perjury. <laughs> you know? And, and it, you should have seen the look on the judge's face. Like his, his world was being turned inside out and upside down. What in the world is the assistant U.S. attorney doing trying to qualify Mr. Skiba's witness against the government? <laughs> and it, he paused and he says, there could be some sort of error here if I were to rule against Skiba. However, I'm inclined to rule in his favor. I'm going to set the bond at $3,000. Well, then this guy, the assistant U.S. attorney, really goes ballistic. We appeal! We appeal! Well, naturally, because for $3,000, it was through a bondsman, it would be peanuts. Skiba could be shopping for a high-power rifle with telescopic sights that afternoon. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, this is a serious charge, threatening to murder a federal judge. <laughs> and uh, so... Anyway, it was like pandemonium, and it was just like, and the reason this this particular U.S. attorney, uh, assistant U.S. attorney, was so agitated is because I'd already sunk him in the previous case, okay? Anyway, when this happened like it happened with me, right there, of course, they took Skiba back to jail because the, the government appealed it's an interlocutory appeal. It stops everything, and and the the three thousand dollar bond setting is frozen, and Skiba goes back to jail until the issue is settled. Okay, so <clears throat> so um, I went home and thought about it, did up the Amicus Curiae affidavit, and I have some of these papers right here. Um, copying them is difficult because. They, machine is not working right, right now. Where do we have this? Here it is. Yeah, here it is. <clears throat> I can pass this around and I'd like to get it back. But in the front here, is the um, is the criminal complaint which threatened to assault and murder the Honorable A. Joe Fish, United States District Judge, with intent to retaliate against Judge Fish on account of the performance of his official duties. <laughs> and and then there's the docket and there's page one, two, three. Here we go on page three. <clears throat> this is where I entered my amicus curiae affidavit. Immediately after that is motion by USA to dismiss, order granting. Motion by USA to dismiss, order granting. Motion by USA to dismiss, order granting. They had to back out of the appeal, the case, the complaint, everything. You know what I'm saying? back out of all of it case dismissed <laughs> all this happened like like machine gun fire after i filed this amicus curia and why is that yeah why is that the F ferguson case the reason is because of the ferguson case which people would you all have it right uh, right. right yeah it was passed out everybody got it oh yes 
Do you have it, Carla? The Ferguson case? No, I mean, yes, it was passed out on a, it's on a, it's sideways on a piece of paper. Oh, okay. It was the first oh, one yes. today. Fine print sideways. So is this whole thing the Ferguson case right here? Yes. Um, well, the, it's the first two pages in the case, but there's more to it. But the thing is that the point is made in the first two pages anyway. The, the rest is more and more of the same. You know, the United States Supreme Court, um, they quote several cases there that the United States Supreme Court, uh, uh, Wisconsin versus Yoder, et cetera, uh, and other cases. Uh, the thing is that all those cases support the premise that, that the First Amendment, they didn't make it the seventh or the twelfth or eighth. First Amendment is number one for a reason. And, you know, free speech and religious freedom, it's all in there. And uh, at, on the religious freedom aspect, um, like I mentioned yesterday, religious freedom is a real powerful tool. And, uh, you know, like the church with the, with the Brazilian tribe, they got their tea, weather customs, and, and the Department of Justice liked it or not. You know, what kind schedule of tea was one. That? <laughs> Schedule one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, anyway, there's cases there that, uh, and some of the stuff that they didn't even cover, but they do cover it on, those, on that second page there. The, of the Ferguson thing, uh, and it says that inquiry by government is foreclosed, right? You see that there? You're looking at the third column about three quarters of the way down, and it says that uh, <coughs> In, inquiry the protection by, of the free exercise clause, is that the one you're talking about? Yeah. It extends to all sincere religious beliefs. Courts may not evaluate religious truths. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And and doesn't it say the inquiry is foreclosed to government? It's not highlighted. Okay. Is it there somewhere? Or am I crossing it with another case? But anyway, what the Supreme Court has said that man may have spiritual experiences that are so profound there are no words for it. And it affects them, you know, to the core of their being. And um, that uh, when it comes to those kind of things, inquiry by government is foreclosed. So, you know, I can't pay the taxes, well, why? Well, um, Moses parted the Red Sea and Jesus turned the water to wine. <laughs> well, that doesn't make any sense. Well, it doesn't have to make sense to you. It makes sense to me. <laughs> you know, it's where it's for close to government. You know, but if you didn't want to get into it, you'd say, well, Jesus turned the water to wine, and he didn't have to pay a tax. Like, uh, you know, these distillers around here. I'll go off the Bible and find arms. Yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, um, this thing of, of render unto Caesar uh, is frequently used as a, a, a thing about the taxes and justifying it, especially from the pulpit, amazingly enough. And uh, I have a different understanding. You can, I'll share it with you and you can tell me if it makes any sense to you. In the scriptures, the, the scribes of the Pharisees came to him with, with trick questions and their intent was to trip him up so they could run to the Roman centurion and say, look what he said, blah, 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 you know, and uh, and get him in trouble. And uh, 
So that was their intent, and they asked this question, and he said to them, Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and unto God that which is God's. So they couldn't run to the Roman centurion because he would have said, Well, that's right. I mean, you render unto Caesar. Um, they would have had nothing to complain about. But there was something more to it because after that, the scriptures say, that they walked, they went away and never dared ask another question. And the reason is, as far as I'm concerned, and the reason is that if you understand, read between the lines, <clears throat> what he was saying to them was that you guys are the scribes and the Pharisees. You're the attorneys of the day. You know the law. The only law we got is what Moses brought to us by the hand of the Almighty. So you know this law, and so render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. Which means this guy is coming over the horizon, pounding his chest, declaring, I am Caesar, and tithe unto me. Okay, so guys, do not cross, do not pass go like in the Monopoly game where you collect money. Do not pass go. Go directly to Caesar and render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. Stone the sucker to death for blasphemy. <laughs> and they were like, uh, and they never dared to ask another question. And they couldn't tell the Roman centurion because he wouldn't understand anyway. That's amazing. Yes, Jesus was a tax person. Luke, the Luke was brought before Pashtada, that's what that's one of the claims against him. I'm talking about the chest pounding, demigod coming over the hill, I am God, render unto me that which is mine. You need to step up and speak to me. Let's use the microphone so it comes over okay. the DVD. Huh? Yeah, I forgot. Never mind. Well, isn't that what Caesar was doing? Yeah, in, in the Roman Empire, Caesar was God. And arbitrarily and capriciously, if he got in a drunken stupor and didn't like what somebody said or looked like or whatever, behead him. <laughs> or, or feed him to the lions in the Colosseum. Did anyone want to look at this? Should I pass this around? No guarantees, though. Mr. Heitman brought up a, an issue that was off microphone and um, it was about when they when the court tells you that you can't file anything anymore. And uh, a thing like that came up with John McLattery, and I was helping him, and you know, a bunch of stuff got filed in the case, and some of it was very serious that, I mean, the, the, the judge just didn't want to deal with the stuff, and we kept on pounding on it. And uh, so the judge, ordered that, uh, and, and this was um, uh, in a civil case, the judge ordered that, uh, that he couldn't file any more papers and they were having a hearing. And this was going to be like, things were, were coming to a head in the civil case and they wanted to seize a whole bunch of the property. And of course, that's what the whole scam is about anyway, because they don't sue anybody who's living in, in a cardboard box under the freeway. You know? they, those guys, they leave alone. But if you've got something, assets, they want to take them away. So, uh, so anyway, um, uh, John was upset, of course. And uh, I said, well, uh, I said, uh, with the, the hearing was coming up the next day, and I said to John, 
because uh, he, he had how did it go? He had just gotten a message on the telephone answering machine, and and he hadn't picked up the mail or something. I forget why, but it was like a last minute bonus <laughs> of the situation, and uh, and he hadn't told me. And that was it. He had told me, uh, and I had told him to remind me of things, and, and he had forgotten them, one thing and another. So anyway, we stuck in this situation. The hearing's tomorrow, and the judge has already ordered we can't file anything, and John is upset, okay? So, because he's looking at losing assets. And uh, I said, well, John, since you're the guy who has to be in the courtroom tomorrow up in Chicago, and uh, he said, I'm going to work all night to, to handle this situation. And I said, by sunrise, the stuff will be hot, rolling off your fax machine. And then I said, as soon as you have it in hand, call me, and I will go over the instructions with you. So that's what we did. And you know, the stuff is rolling off the fax machine as the sun is rising. And, and um, so John calls and we talk about it. And I said, here's what you do. You make your copies, you get them all notarized and stuff, and you take them down to the courthouse. And you be there as soon as they open. And you get the stuff into the county clerk and recorder. And you record it all right there. And then you take it in and uh, and you're not filing it as such with the court, you're giving the court notice, okay? And I brought up a bunch of criminal complaints against the judge in the document, which is now notarized and in the public record. And John is in the courtroom, and they started up on him, and he said, one moment. He said, here's your copy, here's the prosecutor's copy. And they looked at it and they were aghast. <laughs> you know, they took an immediate recess and the prosecutor and the judge go to the judge's chambers and I showed you that diagram with the triangle about ex parte communications they left John standing there in the courtroom and the two of them went off to the judge's chambers to discuss the problem <laughs> and they come back in after their ex parte communications and they determined that this case needs to be put off to some time in the future. <laughs> like as in, and they didn't say this, but like as in when hell freezes over. <laughs> and that was it. Finished. <laughs> you still have a copy of that? Um, I don't, I don't know, I don't think so. See, what's happened to me, Mike, is that. Oh, I know. They, they have attacked me several times. I'm not kidding. I've had nine millimeters at my head where they tell me, you know, I'm out of here and there's been all kinds of my stuff stolen and, you know, I've been put out of places and, uh, you know, forced moves and the rest of that and SWAT attacks and, you know, the thing with the SWAT attacks back in Jacksonville when they came on the third attack. Uh, they came with a 16-foot trailer. They took all the, all the computers, all the file cabinets, all the files, all that stuff. And uh, uh, I mean, leaving me to sit in a chair, look at a blank wall. You know, that's when I left Jacksonville and went down to Austin and was studying criminal complaints with Randy Kelton. And uh, and. So, but got him. I mean, they put me in jail. I was in jail for three days and got out on a Friday. But we made a beeline, just with Judy Scott at the wheel, we made a beeline to the FBI office in Tyler. and. I spoke with the, the head guy over FBI over all of East Texas. And this is the guy, who, by the way, in Jacksonville, they had a police officer that had already raped some 30 women. Now, 
Now, I mean, you wonder, how can you get beyond one? How do you get beyond three? How do you get beyond five? This guy raped like 30 women, protected by the police department, protected by the city, protected by the county. Raping women with his uniform and his badge and his gun, raping them in the cemetery. And he'd take them there and he'd rape them there. And, but this, this guy in, in Tyler, the top FBI agent over all of East Texas, he's the one that came into Cherokee County and arrested the guy. And uh, he was a black man. And uh, I said to him, I said, you've got to do something. They're, they're, they're trying to murder me. And he said, Mr. Fox, they're not going to murder you. And I was like, well, what do you know about it? You know, and I mean, well, let me let me preface this because it, it, I'm, I'm actually starting a, a missing piece here. On uh, June the 11th, when they arrested me, June 11th, 2008, they put me in the jail, the city jail, and like I say, they were loading up the 16 foot trailer with all this stuff, and I'm on the mat there in the jail and pondering the situation. As, and like, why is this happening to me? And what came to me in, is that probably hundreds if not thousands of people have cried out to our Heavenly Father in prayer for relief from this oppression. And I mean, it's serious oppression there when you've got like police doing stuff like raping 30 women. You know, I mean, it, it wasn't just me, it's, it's, it was all over the place there. So what came to me is that it's like I'm the point man in in fixing the situation, and whether I like it or not. And so uh, that's I was pondering that situation. The cell door opens, and this well-dressed black man comes in, flashes his identification, FBI, and says, "I'd like to talk to you for a few minutes." And I'm like in a little bit of a state of shock. Um, and uh, he announces that <clears throat> he says we have your complaints and Judy Scott's complaints and David Boss complaints and uh, he said I want you to know that um, the Jacksonville police have asked the FBI to assist in the search and seizure and uh, he said we have uh, he said I initially didn't want to, to do that but he said, we're, we're doing it. And he said, I just wanted you to know, Mr. Fox, that uh, uh, we have your complaints and, and we have separate people working on the complaints and other people are working on the search and seizure. And uh, we had a pleasant conversation and he left. The chief of police, by the way, was outside the door eavesdropping on the whole conversation. And I didn't know that at the time. I was told that afterwards. Anyway, now, and they jailed me in the city jail, transferred me to county jail. So they were all together three days in, in custody. And then friends bonded me out. And now Judy Scott takes me, and we make a beeline to the Tyler office. And like I say, this, this black gentleman, uh, top guy in the FBI, and I said to him, they're trying to, they're trying to murder me. And he said, they're, Mr. Fox, they're not, they're not going to kill you. And uh, I said, what do you mean? And he said, I've already told the chief of police that if anything happens to Mr. Fox, he's number one on the suspect list. But doesn't that tell you something? I mean, even he knew the jeopardy that I was in, that he would speak up and tell the chief of police, if anything happens to Mr. Fox, you're number one on the suspect list. That's the kind of crime syndicate that, that we're dealing with out there. You understand? So uh, anyway, um, we covered that for you, Mr. Heidman. No. All you have to do is you take you, you, you take what they've done before, put it in a, in a criminal complaint or other stuff, and then get it done up by the by. Uh, uh, notarized and filed in the public record 
And then I'm you won't be. Admit they got an order against me. I can't file anything without this idiot looking at it. Okay. A magistrate judge. But you're not filing it. You take it into them, and or or either you or somebody else, and and you you know put notice on there. So you're giving them notice of what is filed in the public record, and the public record, you guys know, uh, Federal Rules of Evidence 902, right? Well, it's, it's evidence in the record. I know all about. It. Yeah. So. Just putting them on notice like that is going to get their attention. And in McLattery's case, it got their attention sufficiently that they dropped the case right there. Well, let me explain what happened. Go to the microphone. <clears throat> you know, we're, we're restricted in the time here. If you I can make it quick. I can. I did the David Miller stuff. They have a problem with David Miller. The problem is they can't they can't be. That's a real problem for them. So hey, if uh, you may excuse me, but David Miller is not to be all and end all. And when he says that you have to do it in a grammatically correct English, the fact of the matter is that you can go to the law library and see what the Supreme Court writes their stuff in. And they write their stuff in plain English that's right. the way everyone else understands that's, it. That's right. But they, uh, when, when John Roberts was uh, uh, confirmed on September the 15th of 05, uh, a senator from Oklahoma asked him, do you understand the correct sentence structure of communication syntax? He says, yes, sir, I do. He said, well, you hear cases in it. He says, yes, sir, I will. So that was a, a blow and leak. Uh, Leahy immediately jumped up and said, that's enough of this stuff. We're not going for this. <laughs> anyway, I did that with Miller for a while. And I put a case in, and they had no response for it. And uh, he dismissed it. You can't dismiss it, first of all. It was a Title 42, 1983. You can't dismiss it. It has to be heard or settled. So, that was with a judge up in, in uh, I had another case with a judge up in uh, Spokane. They appointed this other judge as a temporary judge because their, their docket was over. And they put that together. And he's the one that came up with the vexing litigator stuff. Now they've been, they've been hammering me with vexing litigators. And uh, just recently, we put in quite a pile of documents. We lifted this case to federal court. And we lifted the second case that has a bearing on this as a, as a necessary party. So um, they jumped on this business that uh, Judge uh, Windmill, his name is, had, had said back two or three years ago, that I may be a vexing litigator. I'm not going to go to their court and listen to this crap, so I didn't go. So he then let it go because it was, he, he turned around and said that uh, he was going to dismiss the case. We can't dismiss the case, but he did. So what's the point, please? The point? What? We need a point. point. I'm getting to the point. Just wait a minute. Yeah, the timeline. <laughs> the point is, is that uh, now they've come up with this same thing again, but they, they did a switcheroo. When I lifted that, I become the, the uh, prosecutor. In other words, I'm the petitioner. So he's now changed it around. I, de I denied a, a magistrate judge, but they, put, it, they, they sent me a letter to a post office. The post office sent it back to him, said they didn't have they could, it was undeliverable. It was deliverable, but they didn't try to deliver it. That gave them an excuse because the post office sent it back to, to uh, dismiss the case. So I wrote them a letter. I wrote them a document, put it in the record. That the case was not dismissed, it was still active. And I put in a continuance of the of prosecution. So now the they combined the two cases. 
under a new case and put the magistrate judge in front of the case, which I had denied already. And the magistrate judge then says, well, I guess we'll just have to let the chief federal judge handle this, but you are going to uh, honor his motion for uh, pre-filing uh, pre review. Now, anything, anything went on and on and on. Nobody can I show this to. I'm not supposed to have anybody know about it or send it in. And it's a pre-filing pre review order. And that's the long and short of it right there. I'm under a pre-filing review order, which means that they can dictate the evidence that's before the court. I have, no, I have no way to get evidence before the court unless I do something and I don't know what to do. <laughs> I didn't get all that. Can you read me? I'm trying to help you, but I didn't understand a thing. Could he ask the court to have that in writing that he cannot defend himself like that? I mean, he cannot. I got an order. It's in writing. Yeah. I mean, okay. it just doesn't that already prove that this whole thing's a shenanigans? Well, yeah, their their whole I mean, thing. Right there. I mean, there's he already won based on that. Their whole thing is a scam. Um, it's a matter of of you know being able to get past all of their shyster shenanigans. Um, there's various ways of doing this stuff. So um, I'll describe one, and that's with the media. And how this came about, this is the real deal. In Jacksonville, they brought four drug charges against me. I don't do any drugs. I don't even take aspirin. But you know what they did? And I was describing to you from the beginning they broke in at the dental clinic. So, and then they wind their way through the whole building and come to me. They had dental antibiotics from the dental clinic that had been closed. And they attribute that to me. While they know that the, they knew before they even knocked on the, you know, they, before they attacked the door, that that was the plan. And uh, so, you know, they got these dental uh, antibiotics charges against me. And the, the Jacksonville newspaper put on the front page, the Jacksonville police have requested the media not to disclose to the public what kind of drugs these are. <laughs> can you imagine trying to stand in the back alley selling dental antibiotics? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I mean the whole thing was preposterous but they were carrying on like it's for real and they had they put a picture of this stuff on the front page of the newspaper and at the pawn shop next door this guy is about dying laughing and he says you know because they got this tray and they got these drugs and prepackaged plastic bags and and right on it is the, the name and address of the dental clinic and all and what drug dealer puts you know it's name and address and folks <laughs> 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 and, and there's on the front page 10,000 pills found you know <laughs> Robert Fox bad guy <laughs> you know and, and so anyhow, the judge was Fletcher, Craig Fletcher, and he's the one that signed the search warrants, and now he's the one going to adjudicate the case against me. And the guy is like, unbelievable. And so I, uh, first I moved to recuse him, and they blew that off. And I figured, okay, I'm going to get real serious now, I'm going to disqualify him. And, and, uh, Anyway, they, uh, they passed that to, um, well, let me say this. This is, this is the actual event where 
They had me in the courtroom, and David bought past me papers that he had cop made copies for me uh, that I had, you know, I had created, created them and stuff I mailed out, and, and, I, and he typed it up and made the photocopies, and now all I needed was my signature. So I'm signing these things, which involve written criminal complaints against Judge Fletcher. But before I did this, uh, I'm there in open court, and, and verbally, I'm making criminal complaints against Judge Fletcher. The, the prosecutor jumps up and calls for a recess. He dashes to the phone to call Judge Ovard, who's the administrative judge over 34 counties in Texas. When Texas is a big place, 254 counties altogether. So while the prosecutor is away, David Bob passes me the, the, the papers. I'm signing them. And I get the clerk in the court to file stamp them. And I hand them to the judge and I put the copy on the prosecutor's desk. He's still at the phone. And, and the judge is aghast that I'm bringing written criminal complaints against him with a file stamp in his own court, you know. And, and, uh, and Randy Kelton stands up in the audience area and declares that he's taking criminal complaints to the grand jury. And they're about, you know, coming unglued, but they're trying their best to maintain their composure and carry on. And, and the prosecutor comes back and says that, uh, you know, it's uh, cleared with Judge Ovard in there to continue and blah, blah. And, and uh, I wrote to Judge Ovard trying to explain the situation. And of course, you know, I told him I made an offer of proof, which yesterday I explained to you. Offer of proof is a very serious matter. But Judge Ovard was blowing it off. And so um, I put in, uh, I sent a letter to, to uh, uh, Pat Shannon with the American Free Press. And, uh, you know, he uh, called Judge Ovard and uh, you know, the question comes down to something like this. Uh, when, where, and how did you acquire the authority to overrule the United States Supreme Court? Speak. <laughs> Speak now. <laughs> Our readers would like to know. <laughs> We're a national publication. And uh, so what happened, in Cherokee County, the fax machine starts up and off rolls one page. Effective immediately, Judge Fletcher is off the case, and Judge Nelms from Dallas is appointed. Signed, John Hobart. <laughs> so you may have to go over their head. Where do you go? Well, there's, you could, with, with them, uh, I'm in the Fifth Circuit of Federal Court of Appeals, and yours is what? Ninth Circuit. Ninth Circuit, okay. So you've got to send something to the Ninth Circuit about the situation. The, the shorter you can make it with getting the message across, the better. Okay? And um, I could do a tape in the court system. Reduce the body of law. Okay. But well, they can do what? They can that they can issue a free review of filing work. That won't work, huh? Well, I mean there's other possibilities that you can let them do their pre filing review. But if they rule in, if they rule that you can move forward, you've got no complaint. And if they don't, then you know, take it to your Ninth Circuit people or contact your congressman or contact the media or do something like that and they hit them from another way. Uh, there was a guy in the East Coast, what he did was he took a van box truck, a big one, like a moving van, and and had it you know, the sign painted on it, 
Judge so-and-so butcher of the Constitution parked across the street from the courthouse. No. I asked people, what do you think that caused? Because I mean, the, the judge looks out the window and sees that truck there. You know what happens? He just picks up the phone and calls out of the police or the sheriff's department and says, out of here. Okay? So what do you think that cost? Any guesses? How many calls missed trial? Pardon me? Missed trial. Well, um, well, most people actually say, well, it would cost him a couple hundred bucks for the, the towing and impound. Now, this guy was closer. He says 20000 Why didn't you say 20000 Well, because it's not going to be cheap. All right. Take the judge off. Okay. Um, you're close, but no cigar. Here's the deal. It was, uh, it was either 200 or 250,000. That's it. That the judge had to pay for violating the First Amendment for speech. Oh, oh my goodness. That is, a, that is a First Amendment violation. There you go. And and um, in Cherokee County, there was like a town festival coming up in the courthouse, one of these old courthouses in the town square, and the festival was going to be all around it all that stuff and all the people coming together. Well, I got four van body trucks, one on each side of the courthouse, painted with the signs, <laughs> and, and uh, I guess they weren't happy. <laughs> we were on CBS television news <laughs> and all of that. Um, the, the police, went and checked every each truck for the license plates, registration, VIN number, all of that. And they didn't touch any one of them. And my guess is that the reason was because they had my phone tapped and knew that if they touched any of those trucks, that the next thing would have been the free speech lawsuit. And what? It would have been a lawsuit for the free speech issue. If they would have taken any of the trucks, so figure that they had the phone staffed. I have other other reasons to believe that, and, and the evidence and so on. Um, and the uh, oh, and going back to the thing with Ovard, yeah, that was one of the things that I believe that that uh, uh, Pat Shannon uh, made an issue of. Was that, that that I had put in my my documentation against Judge Craig Fletcher? That I was making an offer of proof, and that's uh, supported by the Supreme Court case Haynes versus Kerner. And and if I haven't put that in some of the paperwork that I handed out, I'm going to dig up that site and send it to you on email. <clears throat> so. Um, anyway, I guess we'll move to the thing about, you know, going through the criminal process and share with you some pointers uh, that we haven't done so far. Um, <clears throat> first thing is, if there's some rumblings, like instead of having just a normal IRS agent on, on your, you know, hassling you if they say if they flash their badge and say their CID criminal investigation division you know that you're headed to potentially an indictment okay now it isn't just IRS but it could be any situation where you think you're potentially headed to an indictment I will give you a, a real-life example a bunch of guys in Arkansas had what they considered like a, a militia uh, and they had a clubhouse and they had machine guns and they liked to shoot up old cars in the field, make a lot of noise and have a lot of fun. 
and everything was great, except that the FBI and the ATF didn't like that idea. So they mounted a raid on these guys all at one time. I mean, a massive manpower, and everybody got attacked. The clubhouse got attacked, and everybody else got attacked at their homes. And they got the machine gun seized and all that stuff. And the, um, the head guy was Wayne Fincher. And, uh, and I, th I think that the fact that Wayne Fincher had a multi-million dollar chunk of real estate was a factor in this case. But anyway, Wayne Fincher got himself a good attorney. And uh, the guy charged, uh, it was like $25,000 for a case acceptance fee. <laughs> so he looks at the <coughs> at the case, I guess the indictment or something, and determines whether or not he wants to accept it. <laughs> and if he accepts it, then that's what the $25,000 fee is for. And then Wayne Fincher can start paying him to do work on it. <laughs> Is that sweet enough? <laughs> $25,000 case acceptance fee. Anyway, the bill was run up to like somewhere approaching $100,000. Uh, in the process, the other guys could see that it wasn't looking good for them. And they were uh, getting calls or whatever from, from the uh, FBI and, you know, Anytime law enforcement, this just popped in my head, anytime law enforcement asks you questions, what pops in my mind is what old George Gordon said. There's three rules. Keep quiet, don't say anything, and shut up. Can <laughs> <laughs> you so, say that again? <laughs> can you say that again? <laughs> so anyway, um, it's best not to tell them anything. Really. And, uh, you know, everybody thinks that they're going to talk their way out of it. It doesn't work. They use every word you say against you. They have a way of twisting it or construing it. And, and next thing you know, you're up to here. And, and then they'll even say, well, you lied and you're like Martha Stewart and you need to go to prison anyway. <clears throat> so, because Martha Stewart didn't go to prison for inside trading. Insider trading, she went to prison for uh, lying to a federal officer. So, so anyway, um, uh, so what happens is um, these guys are really apprehensive about what's going to happen to them. And uh, I was contacted and I said, okay, here's what we do send a letter to the grand jury foreman, care of the U.S. attorney. In the federal, unlike, say, Dallas County, Dallas County, I know where the grand jury is. It's in the basement of the Frank Crowley Courthouse. And they have actually two grand jury rooms. And you can actually physically go there and tell them I've got criminal complaints I need to address the grand jury and you can potentially get in there. They will resist, but you could potentially get in there, I did. But um, in the federal system, you don't know where they meet, you don't know when they meet, you don't know who the grand jury foreman is or anything. But the U.S. attorney is the one who controls that, so the letter is addressed to the grand jury foreman, <coughs> care of the U.S. attorney, address, etc. Okay, certified mail, and um, so in the letter declare that uh, have exculpatory evidence. Now, uh, I know what this. Uh, good stuff. You like that? Did you? Yep. Yeah. So the letter lands on the desk of the U.S. Attorney. And now the question is, what does he do with it? 
<laughs> well, curiosity gets the cat. He opens the mail. He's opened somebody else's mail. That's a crime. That's number one crime. Yeah. <laughs> and then when he sees that you have exculpatory evidence, that's the last thing he wants to hear. And you want to appear before the grand jury to, to present the exculpatory evidence. Well, he doesn't want that. You know, in, in, in an IRS case, for instance, if you know your stuff and you have something that can, you know, prove your innocence or, you know, they just don't want it there, okay? They want to be able to prosecute you. They want that merit pay increase and all of that stuff. How many people don't know about the merit pay increase? Okay? They get a bribe. Uh, Obama gets 35000 the judge gets 25000 the prosecutor gets fifteen. Uh, they get a bribe from the International Monetary Fund. The IRS is not a part of the government. And they have no business being in the federal court in a criminal case against you, period. It's, it's tantamount to Federal Express knocking on the door of the, of the grand jury or the U.S. attorney and saying, uh, so-and-so owes us some money. We'd like to have them prosecuted criminally in federal court for not paying their FedEx bill. Well, where are they going to go with that? You know what I mean? Take a hike. <laughs> but because it's their pet, the IRS, you know, because they're all communists there, <clears throat> they accept that and they accept the bribe and they prosecute. I mean, what else can you call it? They call it a merit pay increase. And it's right in the, in the law. But the only ones who get the merit pay increase, best I can find out, are the ones who are prosecuting IRS cases. That, by the way, real quick, can be done by a third party as well. Not necessarily by the defendant. A third party can go offer exculpatory evidence to the grand jury. Oh yeah, thank you for, for mentioning that. Um, my friend Eric Leiter from, from uh, uh, Hawaii sued eight federal grand juries for not indicting him. And people say, what? <laughs> How can that be? <laughs> what he did is he discovered that you know, the, the problem of getting to the grand jury in the federal system is pretty serious. And so it goes like this. If Eric and I were at uh, Waco, uh, you know, before the annihilation, uh, and we had high power telescopes, and we look through our telescopes, and we see that, like that famous picture of the guy from Vietnam, He's down on his knees and the guy puts a gun to his head and blows his brains out. And many people have seen that picture. The, the gun, the smoke from the barrel, and the brains flying out the other side. That's, that's a famous picture. Anyway, if we were to see that, and our scopes are so good that we could read the batch numbers on the ATF agents. And we're appalled by what we see. And we, we go to the federal courthouse and to the U.S. attorney, or the judge, doesn't matter which, but we go, we'll say we go to the U.S. attorney, and we say we're eyewitnesses to murder of the Branch Davidian, blah, blah, and we saw the ATF agents who did it, and we, we read their badge number, because we had really good scopes. We read their badge numbers, and we wrote them down, and these are the guys that did it, and we're prepared to identify them in a lineup, and so on and so forth. And the uh, U.S. attorney says, don't you ever come in this office again. Get the hell out of the building, and, and I don't want to ever see you around here again. And if you are around here, I'll have you arrested for trespass or whatever crap they want to come up with. And we step out in the hallway and we're like, well, how do we get the truth into the court or anything? Well, Eric Leiter figured it out. 
and and it is that he, he comes in with his confession and he confesses that he was in conspiracy with the ATF agents that murdered the little children at Waco, et cetera, et cetera. And he confesses to the conspiracy. And because he's involved in the conspiracy, that he has an automatic end to the grand jury to tell him about his co-conspirators. <laughs> but I think they sensed that coming and see, if the grand jury investigated, they would find that, yes, the little children were killed, and the only ones who were there that could have done it is the ATF, because they kept everybody else out. The news media couldn't even come in. They had to have those gigantic lenses on top of their big trucks to be able to see what was going on there as best as they could, and they couldn't see the other side of the building or anything, you know? So, so anyway, they, they had that figured out, so the grand juries would never let Eric Leiter come in and explain any of this stuff. And they kept him out, so he sued eight federal grand juries for not indicting him. It's pretty amazing. Um, and actually, Eric Leiter, his girlfriend, and uh, Jeff, a friend of mine, and myself, we worked all night on stuff for the Branch Davidians and as the sun came up and we're sitting at Denny's having breakfast, it was a matter of deciding who was going to take it down to Waco and uh, Jeff and I took it down to Waco and we tried to get it filed in the federal court and the FBI were running interference and all of that stuff. And I went down to, to, to Waco seven times. I was arrested twice. It's a heartbreaker that they killed all those people. You were going to say? No, oh, I'm actually swatting these flies. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. I was just going to ask you to um, ask to repeat that. Did you say the um, crap? I came all up here for having a question. Um, <laughs> oh, the, the exculpatory evidence. Did you say that the, the merit increases were actually written in the law or something like that? The what? The, the, um, the merit increases that the prosecutors re received for prosecuting IRS right. cases, did you say that was written in the law? Yeah. Um, can we have the citation or reference for that, or did you say it? I just missed it. Is it the IRS manual, or is it in the statutes? It's in the statutes. It's in the United States Code. Um, I have the stuff, and if you'll be kind enough to remind me later, like, uh, I don't have it right here, but, um, I have it in, in a computer back in, in Texas, and it can be part of the stuff I emailed to you. To all of us, you mean? Yes, all of us. <laughs> no, just me. <laughs> <laughs> well, remember, everything is negotiable. We all have your email address. I'm going to you that Oh, no, I'm not finished that segment. You, I mean, can we continue on with the... Yeah, yeah, my, yeah, my question was, is you don't put the exculpatory evidence in the letter. No, 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 okay. you don't need to. I'll clarify that for you. Don't, you don't need to, because it's best that you don't. Even if you have exculpatory evidence, it's best that you do not alert them to what you have. You know, because the... It's like, say this, you got, say, three items of exculpatory evidence and they have a way to shoot you down on those three. But while the letter's in the mail, you think of two more. But now they've shot you down on the three and they're not gonna let you see the grand jury. You know? And then next thing you know, you're indicted. Well, I, so anyway, if you go back to the situation with the guys in Arkansas, you know, the, the letter was sent, the, uh, 
No contact was made with the grand jury. The FBI tried to contact, uh, you know, our guys in, in Arkansas and tried to get them to uh, acquiesce to this process. And it's now, you know, and uh, and they uh, uh, said, you know, we never got to see the grand jury. We think that the U.S. attorney intercepted the mail, and that's mail fraud, and where your system is crooked, and so on and so forth, you know. And the whole thing went away for those other guys. Wayne Fincher got six years in prison after after he yeah after he paid the attorney almost a hundred grand. He gets six years in prison, and the stuff that I figured out for these guys finished the case off. The whole thing was. It was like shot because they couldn't do anything. You know, in another situation which involved the IRS, uh, the guy was contacted by the FBI as to what exculpatory evidence he had. And he says, wait a second, you're the FBI? I never wrote to the FBI. I wrote to the grand jury. Did somebody open the grand jury's mail? Because <laughs> that sounds like mail fraud. And he said the FBI was hyper anxious to get off the phone. It's like, well, we're going to send a letter back. Uh, uh, we didn't have anything to do with this. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's like pre-indictment stuff. And I should probably describe something else too that's very important. Um, a, a fellow, this has been related to me uh, by somebody else. I wasn't there, I didn't physically see this, but it all makes sense and you'll understand why. So a guy, you know, got in, in front of the grand jury and the first thing he does is uh, figure out who the, who the, uh, no, who the attorney is. Okay, so the, the, the grand jury are dressed like regular people, and attorney is dressed in the suit, right? So he says to the attorney, are you a part of the grand jury? Well, the guy answers truthfully that uh, no, he's not a part of the grand jury, but he tries to make his deal that he's, you know, assistant U.S. attorney or whatever and um, the guy says you're not a part of the grand jury so you can either leave or if you're going to stay here you sit over there and you don't make any faces or signals and he turns to the grand jury foreman he says you're the grand jury foreman and uh, do you, what are your questions for me? Stuck because the attorney is the one who dreams up the questions and asks and the grand jury sits there like they're being entertained, okay? When he asks the grand jury foreman, what questions do you have for me? The grand jury foreman is stuck. He has no questions. And so then the guy says, since you have no questions for me, but I do know about the situation, here's what it is. Bing, 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 bing. No build. Have a great day. That's the greatest inside information. Hmm? That's the greatest, the greatest inside information. Yeah. Yeah. Father, what do you do if you ask to go before the grand jury and then the prosecutors denies that? Denies your appearance to come before the grand jury? Well, the, this is why I'm saying it gets sent by mail and certified mail. So that. What if you've done that and they still deny it? Did they send you a letter, Susie? Mm -hmm. Well, then, that's another thing for. Not the not the grand jury. The process, yeah. They didn't send you a letter. Microphone. Microphone. I, I requested. They called me. He called me. Yeah, the, the prosecutor called me and said we are. Uh, Maybe going to indict you. Don't know for sure if we're going to or not. Uh, but I understand you have exculpatory evidence. 
And if you have any, this is your opportunity to turn it over to me. <laughs> and I said, no, I don't think so. I said, I do have exculpatory evidence, and I want to take it and present it to the grand jury. And um, he says, no, that's not possible. You have to turn it over to me. And I says, no, This I don't. is a conversation on the phone. Right, and so I... Okay, any... This is what I recommend to people if you, if it, you know, you need to have a recording device at your phone. I mean, it just as a as a routine precaution, but for for this kind of situation when you when you could be involved in litigation like this, you need to be able to when you pick up the phone, click on record. At the very second that you know that you're talking to one of the systemites. Because if you had that conversation recorded, then you could bring it bring it into court, and you know he'd be toast. Uh, yeah, well, he'd be toast because isn't that right, Mark? He'd be toast. Well, I have it on um, letterhead. I mean, he sent me letterhead and told me also. That oh well, then that's even better. That's even better. You need to put that in a public record or something yeah. and bring it in as 902 evidence when you go for your sentencing. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that destroys the case. <coughs> should, should, should you always request writing never a phone call? Yeah. You should always request it and write it. Absolutely, if she got it in writing. I had a question about that. You said that um, we should always record the conversations. What about the admissibility of that evidence? In some states, I know that the recorded party, the party being recorded, is supposed to be told in advance in order for it to be admissible. Okay. Please ask, elaborate. Okay. You, uh, you're, you're, you're right. You're hitting on something here. And it goes like this. Different states have different laws. But in Texas, we don't have that problem. That's why I was just speaking like I was about recording everything. Um, Aaron, what was you saying? So... I was in federal court, and um, as a matter of fact, it was Judge Jerry Buckmeyer, the one who, who ex parte deal, sent me to Springfield. And um, you know, let me say, there was two inmates that were locked up. One of them, uh, they, at first they were together, then they separated them, and then I won my case with the State Department, and, I still took phone calls from other inmates, and one of them says, uh, his name is Dwight, and he said, uh, uh, Dwight says to me, he said, Werner may be being turned by the feds and going to testify against me to get himself a, a better deal. And he said, Robert, could you could record the conversation with him and ask him these questions. Is it something that you want to Bring in about that. Well, I want to go back to the grand jury thing. We're okay. going to talking about that grand jury. When you go before the grand jury, excuse me, <coughs> we were called in before the grand jury, and that prosecutor started asking all the questions. And I did, like you said, excuse me, I came here to speak to the foreman of the grand jury and the grand jury. And he says, well, you're going to talk to me. I'm going to ask the questions here. I said, I believe you're not part of the grand jury. I think you should be able to sit down or leave. He said, no, that's not the way it works here. You're going to answer my questions. So he started asking me the questions, and I said, well, I would like to invoke my Fifth Amendment rights to not in, in, you know, in, indicate anything against myself in this case. So ask your question, and every time he asked me a question, I said, well, I'll stand on the Fifth Amendment on that. And so after about 10 or 15 questions, he says, well, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, apparently, Mr. McBride is going to take the Fifth Amendment on every question, so there's no sense asking me any more questions. And this is where I dropped the ball, and I didn't know it. I turned around, and he looked at the jury and says, Does anybody in here have any questions of Mr. McBride? And this lady jumps up and says, Well, I guess ain't no sense us asking him any questions if he's going to take the Fifth Amendment on everything. And I turned around and left. And I should have said, ma'am, ask your question. I haven't heard your questions yet. All I've heard is from this dumbass. <laughs> exactly. 
And I didn't come here to answer his questions. So ask your questions and let's see if I take the Fifth Amendment because I came here to tell my story. And I didn't and I blew it. So if you get the opportunity, remember that. Don't answer his questions, but ask the, the, the grand jury to ask you the questions and answer them. Can you just order? Just get over there and shut up! I did that. I said, excuse me, you're not part of this grand jury. You have no business in this room. I came here to speak with the foreman of the grand jury and the grand jury. He said, that's not the way it's conducted here. That's the way it's going to be now. 